diverse thinking to the podcast from a generational aspect. Change doesn't have to be overwhelming. Once you've made change, your mind knows how to make change. At any stage of our lives, we are unstoppable. Hello and welcome to Unstoppable from Vision One High Performance Group. My name is Lori Moen, and this podcast is for you, a business leader, a business owner, someone who may perhaps feel a little bit stuck trying to navigate a critical change, maybe struggling to realize your full potential. That's what this Unstoppable podcast is all about. Then we have Tyler Bonhoom. How you doing, Lori? Tyler, great to have you here. And finally, we have Michelle Bonahoom. Hi, Lori. Hi there. Today, we're excited to welcome our guest, Steve Kalina, President and CEO of the Minnesota Precision Manufacturers Association, MPMA. Now, Steve, as the leader of MPMA, they serve the manufacturers in Minnesota, working to coordinate with partners across the state in order to unite and strengthen Minnesota manufacturing. Steve stepped into this role in 2018, I learned, after he drove a big change for himself. When he chose to leave the family business where he is a second generation owner and had been working in the business for 20 years, he grew up in the business. And Steve, oh, you have a great story to share on what it took to make that change and why and what you learned and what we can learn and not just from that change, but from other aspects of your life. So Steve, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great to see you guys. You yeah, bet. Yeah, good to see you, Steve. You know, it was fun when we were talking earlier about your background, because some of it I knew and some of it I didn't know. And so I was thinking back on that conversation. And one of the things that you shared before you talked really about stepping into the MPMA role was the aha moment you had back in 2006, I think it was. Well, and it just, uh, you know, talking about unstoppable and just uh, having that kind of a mindset. Um, you know, that's what you and I were talking about a little bit and just how uh, there's those moments in life where you realize there, there's no easy answer. There's no easy solution. You just you just have to figure it out and you just have to not let things uh, get in your way. So yeah, back in 2006, though, was when I kind of made the transition from employee of a business, a family owned business to being a leader in that business. But it was uh, a transition. One of our key managers was unfortunately moving on uh, for less than ideal reasons. And so my father, the, the owner of the company, came to me one day and, and said, hey, you're unfortunately, we're going to be parting ways with your boss, the key manager of the business. And, uh, you know, are you you ready to take over? <laughs> I said, well, wow. no, I don't know. You know, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not ready, but I said, but I'll be ready. And I said, I'll, I'll make it work. And so that was kind of my transition, a, a one moment transition from uh, employee to leader and manager. But it was, it was a, it was a moment of confidence too, of just knowing that, you know what, I'll figure it out. I'll make it happen. I have support. I have people around me. That's, and I think that's the difference for a lot of people. I mean, obviously I've known Michelle for a lot of years and she's an amazing leader, but you, uh, you take people who are maybe more fearful and a little more timid and hesitant and unsure of themselves and, and to be a good leader, good leader, I'm an aspiring leader. Uh, no, you're a great leader, Steve. <laughs> it's when those moments come up, but it's like, you know what, you're not going to have the answer. I mean, you look at COVID and, and amazing, all the leaders across the country, across the world and they had to deal with like what's the answer yeah. business leaders too i mean what's the answer yeah. nobody yeah knew. absolutely no yeah. one so you got to do what you think is right and just move forward so yeah how old were you during that aha moment 25 i guess so. 25 wow so you were a young leader to be mm -hmm. taking on that level of responsibility yeah. day one That's i amazing. just sit down with a couple of my key people that were double my age and say you know what <laughs> Now you report to me, but I rely on you. You know, you're the you're the you're the people with the knowledge, and I'm here to serve you. And it was a a good learning lesson on servant leadership, real quick. Yeah. Well, Steve, I just have a quick question for you about the young leadership. You know, when you're that 25 year old leader, what was that approach that you had to take when it came to I'm younger and I have to talk to these older people and convince them to trust me, convince them to do what I want them to do? What kind of approach did you take there? Well, like I said, you know, I sat down with them right away, acknowledging that, hey, you know, I'm, I'm not here to uh, dictate to you. I'm not here to be the expert to tell you how to do your job. I always tease people, you know, and, and I think this is a case in a lot of leadership roles. It's like, you know, the uh, the people who aren't as skilled and talented obviously get there or sometimes get uh, elevated because you can't afford to lose the people who really know the work really well. And so, I mean, just acknowledging to them that, hey, I, I'm relying on you. I need you. You guys are the real assets. I'm here to support you and help you do what you need to do and make this business a success. So, you know, just, just making sure I wasn't getting in their way and, and uh, letting them know that I trust them and respected them. So 
Um, and you continued there in another 12 years in leadership sure. before that next big change. No, and I mean, uh, that was a, a major life decision. You know, I'd been at the company, a family business again for 20 years. I, I told you, Lori, I had a, a pillow in yeah. my office and uh, I could name every single employee, every customer. I knew the products in and out. Again, I, my beginnings there started cleaning toilets and pulling weeds and, and moving up gradually over the years. So it was my second home and, and my right. second family, really. And they are still to this day. But yeah, I mean, I, I just realized for a number of reasons that I, I was ready for a transition and uh, building those people around you, those trusted people makes such a world of difference. And I mean, you can have that confidence and you can rely on those people so that when these life changes occur, that, that you're not out there on your own and figuring it out. So for me, it was just having for years, and I'll say that was probably the best gift my dad ever gave me in, in business was he got me connected to all these people around me. That just gave me a sense of confidence, right? I just knew that no matter what direction I took, no matter what came my way, I had people I could rely on. And that was that was worth so much to me to this day. It's just it is. That requires a lot of mindset change as you're stepping into something that you hadn't been necessarily thinking about. What were some of the mindset shifts you needed to make as you stepped into both of those leadership positions? Well, I think it is. And in fact, I shared the story with Lori too. And uh, you guys know Amy Cruz really well. Uh, Amy had given me a book years ago. It was called Praying Circles Around Your Children. Sweet book. It was beautiful. I, you know, I thought about a lot with my kids. And then again, when I think about people I work with being an extended family. And so I took that principle and applied it there and just, I don't have control over these things. And this is whether it's a religious standpoint or just life in general, right? We don't have control over everything. We don't have control over the pandemic. We don't have control over the economy. But I think that's part of the mindset and, and part of my maturing was realizing that I need to be able to just, again, rely on other people, rely on God, rely on, you know, just faith and things and, and being able to uh, trust that things are going to work out, do what's right, make the right decisions, do what you, uh, you know, what you believe in, surround yourself with good people. And then uh, I always talk about, you know, just the way you're wired what you're passionate about, because I can't imagine doing a job that you don't love. I mean, I just, uh, to me, work is not work. It's just fun stuff I get to. I mean, I'm blessed to do a pretty fun job, but being able to do something you're passionate about. So, because I mean, some people, it's like, you know, I go on a vacation and I'll be doing some little work, you know, after hours, after the kids are asleep and it's like, oh, you're on vacation. I'm like, but I enjoy my work. So yeah, I know I need to do family stuff and be a, uh, do other things. But I think that's just a really important for anyone as they look into their career path is just finding something that they're passionate about and that they will actually enjoy because I can't imagine doing anything else. Well, and you know, like a lot of people say that they, they say, oh, we need to raise up the next generation, but that's something you've modeled really well, Steve. And so I'd love to hear you tell the audience about some of the things that you are doing with the young audience. I was at a um, trap meet with my son a couple months ago and your group was there and he left inspired, like he knows he wants to be in manufacturing and he wants to bring his skills and technology to that because of the work that you're doing. So talk about, you know, some of the ways that you and MPMA and some of your other um, organizations are really working to help that younger generation find their passion. Um, so students actually do kind of know what manufacturing is, they just don't realize it. And so a big part of it is just helping them understand really what those careers are, what those what those companies are. And so that's uh, Minnesota Manufactured is a, uh, uh, an awareness campaign that was actually launched by the state college system. And then we've kind of adopted it as our own campaign. And so we're going full fledged ahead. So that uh, trap shooting event, that was our Minnesota manufactured booth, that same yeah. setup, except now with virtual reality and um, an actual CNC mill. Uh, those are going to be at the state fair all 12 days. But we're nice. just getting that out there everywhere we can. So we've got banners that are going up on the sides of buildings. So they'll, you know, they'll say we are Minnesota manufactured. And every time a uh, business buys one of those, we donate one to a, a school. So kids will see it walking down the hallways in school. Mm -hmm. The Minnesota Wild, they're going to do one or two games with us this year that are Minnesota manufactured nights of the Minnesota Wild games. A big part of it is just getting that word out, helping kids understand what those careers look like. But then we have to figure out the next steps too, right? So if a kid like a young man like Tyler came up to me and said, <laughs> hey, I'm interested in a career in manufacturing. Um, great. Here's information. Here's a website. Here's links that's all fine, but what's he supposed to do with that? And so that's yeah. a lot of what we're going to be doing with this driver five grant is nice. taking those next steps. How do we connect that young person to a manufacturer to do an apprenticeship nice. program? How do we get them to go take a tour of the local technical college? How do we help them sign up for grant funding or a scholarship to pay for schooling? And Steve, when you start connecting with the younger community like that, what result is that 
kind of bringing in terms of the manufacturing industry and just everything like that? You know, it is, it's been uh, pretty inspiring lately to see some of these businesses that are getting more young people in. And, you know, a lot of us, I mean, uh, Lori talked about our, our different generation uh, uh, groups uh, that we represent on this call today. But, you know, we, we look at these young people and, and question or complain about their work ethic or what their, you know, focus is and all these things. And it's like a lot of the young people I see, yeah, they are very different than the former generations, but their ability to adapt, their hunger for learning and growing, their ability to be flexible and be, uh, you know, multi-focused on things that I've never seen in previous generations, at least and not not to that extent. So a lot of these young people find the right fit and right in, in the right uh, partners in, in companies and, and schools, they're doing dynamite. And so for companies to recognize that, adapt their processes, right? They can't, they can't train the same way they have previously. We're seeing a lot of success with companies that are focused on it, right? There's plenty of companies that are not focused on it yet. And you walk through their shops and you see a lot of gray hair, which is great as far as the experience and the skills, but not great for tomorrow. And then you walk through some shops, you'll see a lot of 20, 25 year olds. I just love that you highlight, you know, I mean, the importance of bringing in the younger generation. Something that I want to ask you is what kind of tips have you had um, with training the younger generation and kind of getting the job done at the end of the day? Yeah, well, that's a good question. I'd say not focusing too much on a sequential learning path or linear paths. That's the way we typically train in the past. You know, you graduate, you take tech ed in high school, you graduate high school, you go to this tech school, you graduate, you go find a job. You know, and then then it's pretty much you're just, you know, thrown into the mix and 20 years later, you're a skilled person. Most young people, I think, are not patient for that process anymore. They're not willing to just sit and wait and, and see what happens years down the road. And so I think companies that recognize that and are able to find a more comprehensive approach. And so what we promote for anyone and everyone is a multifaceted approach where a student's going to start school they better be starting to do on the job training as well. And the schools are not perfect, right? They're not going to teach everything, every industry or every company needs and every technology and every application, but they have a foundation. Whereas the employers aren't necessarily maybe as good at structured training. They don't have you know, uh, certified teachers, but they also have real world expo experience and, and uh, applications. And so combining those two, I think is absolutely crucial. It not only gives you a better depth of training, but also muscle memory, you know, no different than any of us learned in school when you learn math or you learn anything else and having a mentor helping them on the job too is, is absolutely crucial so that they can keep practicing and practicing and practicing, practicing learning that muscle memory so that they keep building and keep growing. Yeah. You know, what I find fascinating and like hearing you talk about is what you're saying is it's challenging those of us that are of an older generation to change our mindsets, to be open to looking at a bigger picture for ourselves. And, and, you know, it's fun to hear you talk about it because that's inspirational, I think. And it's, you know, where do you, where do you get that from? You know, what makes you think, not so much think, but to be able to apply those principles of let's try it. Let's, you know, something that you've had at the core of who you are. Where does that come from? Well, and I shared a couple of stories with you, uh, Lori, about my time in the Marine Corps and that, I mean, that definitely forged who I am. And just that, again, that mentality of like, well, you just got to try things. And I've told my staff with this, uh, some of these activities lately is, you know, we don't know what the right answers are. I mean, if we did, then we would have been doing them years ago, right? We think we've got the right ideas, um, but sometimes you just got to try it and go for it. And so whether it's in the Marine Corps or in business, it's like, you just, you got to trust your instinct. My dad talks about that all the time, trusting your gut. Uh, sometimes you just got to go with what you think is the right thing. So yeah, I mean, it just that confidence from, from my military experience and, and doing things that were probably stupid at the time. And, and I, you know, but just, you you try them and uh, things work and you learn or things don't work and you learn. Yeah. And uh, Wow, that's awesome. Neat. I'd love to switch gears just a little bit. Our audience may have heard or may not have heard that, you know, there's a lot of generational wealth that's transferring over the next 10 years. You know, $10 trillion of generational wealth. Baby boomers are wanting to exit their businesses and transition leadership. So I'd love to hear from your perspective. Coming from a family business, you talked yeah. a lot about your dad and how he's transitioned and given you a lot of what you know. And you've kind of taken that and added some new vision to it. And even though you're, you're still not in the family business, you're really taking it to the manufacturing world. Mm -hmm. So talk about what you're seeing in manufacturing in regards to generational transfer. 
Yeah, I mean, obviously there were just a surge of baby boomer entrepreneurs that started a lot of these companies back in the you know mid to late seventies and early eighties, and uh, so a lot of just great companies that have been around for you know 40, 50 years are ready for those transitions, right? One of the things that I've been disappointed in that a lot of successful manufacturing leaders, I love the industry, I've been successful, but in this industry is, you know, it's, uh, there's challenges to running a business. So I, I want something better for my kid. And so they steer them in a different path. When you have that transition, whether it's a generational transition or transition to management, I think there's, there's been a gap there where business leaders aren't realizing how much knowledge transfer they need to give to that next group of leaders. It's not just about running the business, it's about outside of those four walls. And so I think that's important for anyone, whether you're looking to transition your business to your child or, or willing to sell your business outside, realize the value in, in what you've accomplished over yeah. you know, 40, 50 years and, and make sure that knowledge gets transferred. Yeah. yeah. And to your point from earlier, it's not necessarily just the knowledge, but also like the connections. You, know, like yeah. you said you were grateful your dad gave you those awesome connections. Well, that's why, you know, uh, how Vision One takes that approach with more of a comprehensive, holistic approach, because when you look at a business transition, the first things you think about are all valuation and you know, terms of the sale and whatever, but there's so much more to it. Make sure you've got a healthy business leadership structure, you know, employee satisfaction and, and good culture and all those things that feed into it. And without that, you're putting your company at jeopardy if you haven't addressed those things. So great. It's uh, awesome. So if you were to kind of give advice to the next generation of leadership, what would it be? Well, it's funny because, yeah, I was talking about the, that with uh, Tyler last week. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I think, again, from my experience is that that community of support around you. So whether you're going to be a business owner, business leader, or just a leader in your community, whatever, but having people around you, I think it's so important. And so those relationships with the banker that you formed 40 years ago when you were founding your business and you had no cash and you had no assets and you're trying to, you know, get a banker to, to partner with you and give you an opportunity, you Take that to heart and it means something you know it means a lot right versus if you're taking over a business or you're coming into the leadership role and you've never experienced that you don't have the same appreciation for those partners and so whether it's banking partners accounting partners uh supply chain partners anyone uh, your customers obviously building those relationships outside of your four walls I think, especially as a, a key leader in a business i think it's important that we that you focus on that and uh, develop those relationships yeah, that's awesome. There's so many good nuggets. Steve, you are have always amazed me as a leader and I love have loved working with you. But I heard first, you know, understand your passions. And especially at a young age as parents, if we can help our kids, help them to understand what they're passionate about and, and help to draw that out. And then I heard you that leadership is really oppor opportunistic. You had some intention with those some of the transitions, but a lot of it kind of came to you and you needed to be ready to step in. And we call it get off go. You just have to like go go and then figure it out. And then you talked a lot about servant leadership and humility. And I know you as, as such a humble leader. And so I think that's probably a big key to your success is that and in the support network that you talked about is that you didn't go alone. We, we have a saying in Unstoppable, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And uh, you're like, you're just a walking example of that. And then I heard you talk about how important it is to train our next generation of leadership differently. We all learn um, when we, when we do, and we teach, but that younger generation even more so. So as, as leaders to be thinking about how are you building your training programs in a way that are multifaceted and that are capturing that institutional knowledge, which is kind of that last point that I heard you talk about is that, you know, with our generational transition, how are we as business owners capturing that institutional knowledge and those relationships and making sure that, um, they're transferred to the next generation of leadership. So thank you for all of the wonderful nuggets. Is there anything that we missed that is burning on your heart to talk about and leave our audience with? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll just give a plug, I guess, for the, again, the Minnesota Manufactured Campaign. I would encourage anyone in the industry or related to the industry to help promote that. Uh, uh, the phrase we started using a few years ago is one conversation. And so we're trying to create tools and resources that help help that conversation. So if you've got you know, someone in manufacturing who's got a 17 year old neighbor, instead of going and handing him a brochure about career paths and, and uh, opportunities in manufacturing, just to have a conversation about uh, you know, what their what their job is about. And if we get the industry to embrace that and just start having those one conversations, you know, just if, if all of us rather than 
just the industry leaders and the HR leaders doing it. Everyone does it, and everyone has those conversations, and everyone shares those those insights. Man, we're gonna we're gonna reach a lot more young people and have a lot better opportunity, especially in those groups that are underrepresented today. We got a lot better chance of getting them uh, in the industry. So. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. It was great to see you today. And and Michelle and Tyler love hanging out with you. So thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Unstoppable. And we hope this episode left you thinking, inspired, maybe ready to take that first step for your own challenge, to face a challenge, start getting unstuck, and to start making your desired change happen in your life, in your business, in your community. Here at Vision One, we're passionate. We're passionate about helping business leaders, organizations, and communities in effectively navigating critical change, such as growing your business, getting your business ready to exit, getting yourself ready for your next chapter, transitioning to the next generation of leadership. Imagine having a team, a team that's working beside you every step of the way, providing strategic planning, fractional financial services, fractional operation and HR services, and that it's tailored for you. That's what Vision One High Performance offers. So if you're interested in learning more about how we can help you get unstuck, be unstoppable for yourself and make some big changes, let's connect. Maybe it's through an unstoppable peer group, maybe a retreat, an internal workshop. You know, I invite you to check in at vision1performance.com. Check our website. It's about starting with one conversation.